Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the SFL webinar series. My name is Leah Paul Gashley, and I'm the director of the SFL webinar series and an executive board member of SFL. We are honored to have Craig Biddle deliver a talk tonight on Ayn Rand's theories of rights. Before we begin, though, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Students for Liberty in the webinar series. Students for Liberty is a 501c3 nonprofit organization run by students and for students dedicated to liberty. We were formed three years ago to serve a previously unfilled niche in our universities, connecting liberty-friendly students with other students, faculty, organizations, and resources to help them advance their ideas and applications of classical liberalism. The resources we offer include free books for student groups, a speaker's network, protest grants, handbooks on running a student organization, tabling kits, leadership training, an academic journal for liberty and society, and our bread and butter conferences. The SFL webinar series is a way of giving you access to the ideas and mentorship and liberty year-round from wherever you are. We hold webinars each week to put you in touch with the top mentors and scholars for liberty in the country. For a full list, please visit our website, studentsforliberty.org. Tonight's webinar is with Craig Biddle. Craig is the editor of the Objective Standard and, and, and the author of Loving Life, the, the Morality of Self-Interest and the Facts that Support It. He is currently also writing a book on the principles of rational thinking and the fallacies that are violations of those principles. Mr. Biddle has spoken at universities across the country, including Stanford, Duke, Tufts, UVA, UCLA, UM, Wisconsin, and MyU. He regularly lectures at objective, objectivist conferences as well. His website is www.craigbiddle.com. Just to note, there will be about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of the webinar. Feel free to type in any questions into the question box. For those interested, this webinar will be recorded and archived on our website in the next few days. We will be sending you more detailed information about Students for Liberty and our upcoming webinars in the follow-up email. And without further ado, I present to you Craig. Thank you, Leah. And thank you, Students for Liberty, for uh, organizing this event. And thank you, uh, attendees, for tuning in. Um, so we're here to talk uh, about Ayn Rand's theory of rights. But I want to begin with uh, some common ground. Um, this is uh, being put on by Students for Liberty. And uh, I think it's safe to assume that everybody tuning in is interested in liberty. We all recognize uh, the importance of liberty on some level. Uh, we may have some different views of what liberty is or how to defend it, but I think we are all here because we know that liberty is a crucial value. It's something that we want to uh, protect. It's something we want to achieve uh, first and protect. And uh, that common ground is a good place to kick off. Um, the most important thing to do from that ground, though, is to define liberty. What is this thing that we want to defend? Uh, what exactly is liberty? Well, it's fairly uncontroversial that liberty is the absence of physical force. It's the freedom to act on your own judgment. It's the freedom to pursue your goals, uh, to live your life the way that you see fit. But the shortest definition of liberty is simply the freedom to act on your judgment. And it's important to really grasp what that means. Uh, it means that you, in, in a society of liberty, a society that, that recognized the importance of and actually defended liberty, you would be free to choose whatever career you want, to uh, run your business however you see fit, uh, to marry whomever you like, uh, to eat whatever you choose to eat, to use whatever drugs you see fit, whether they be for your health or for recreational purposes, you would be literally free to act on your judgment regardless of what anybody else thought of it, uh, so long as you're not violating other people's liberty. And that's what this thing is that we're after. Now the question is, it's simple enough to say what liberty is. The question is, why is it good? Why is liberty right? What makes a culture of liberty the right kind of culture as against, for instance, a culture of statism or communism or socialism or fascism or just outright, outright slavery? To defend liberty, we have to offer a moral case for it. It's not enough just to say, well, here's what liberty is and that's what we want. You have to say why it's right because, of course, the 
socialists will come back and try to, to take the moral high ground and say, well, here's why socialism is right. People have needs, and we've got to give them what they need, and so on. You, you've heard their argument. So what is the moral case for liberty? Now, of course, the United States was founded on ideas of why liberty is morally right. According to the founders, we have inalienable rights, rights to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. And the idea here, uh, which the founders got substantially from John Locke, uh, who built on some earlier uh, 17th century rights theorists, but the general idea is that you have a right to live your life as you see fit, that's the right to life, to act on your own judgment, the right to liberty, to keep, use, and dispose of the product of your effort, the right to property, and to pursue the goals of your choosing, the right to the pursuit of happiness. When you have these rights, they're inalienable. You have them re regardless of what others think, and you have them prior to uh, the existence of a government. Now, that was a great idea, and it was enough to found the United States and get this great experiment in liberty going. But as we all know, uh, we're not doing so well on that count some 200 years later. Our freedoms are uh, dissolving before our eyes in many ways. I don't need to recount that to you. To defend liberty over time, we need to do more than just define what rights are. It's, it's one thing to be able to say what the right to life is, what the right to liberty is. It's another thing to be able to say where these rights come from, why we have them, what facts of reality give rise to these rights, and how do we know that we have them? rights? So what are rights, where do they come from, and how do we know it? I think these questions are, are some of the most crucial questions facing us today. Because if we can't answer these questions, we simply can't defend liberty. Now, historically, there are essentially three answers to these questions. The question is, what are rights? Where do they come from? How do we know? <clears throat> the first of these, uh, which is very popular among uh, uh, conservatives and Republicans today, is that rights are moral laws that come from God. Uh, there's allegedly a God, and he created the universe and us and creates moral law. And one of the moral laws that he created is that we have rights. I guess, to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, and we, we know this uh, according to religion, the same way we know uh, just about everything that's important on, on religious grounds, and that is through faith. Uh, it's not like God comes down to you in the morning and, and gets in front of you and tells you you have these rights. You have faith that there's a God, and so you, you accept the idea that he gives you these rights through that same method. So that's the first, first idea. The second idea, historically, on what rights are and where they come from is that rights are political laws. So they come into existence once there is a government. The government uh, dictates what rights the people that uh, exist under that government have or, and what rights they don't have. And that's that. So you, you have rights and they come from government. And the third historical uh, answer to these questions is that rights are moral laws uh, and they're inherent in man's nature. And this is the idea that rights are, are natural. They're, they're, uh, they're inherent in your nature, just like you have lungs and a heart, and those have some uh, uh, significance in your life. You have rights. They're, they're inborn, in effect. They're innate. And they have significance in your life. Now, each of these ideas is uh, highly problematic. Uh, even that third, which I, I think may not be as obvious to you, I think the first two you can probably get an, an idea of what the problems are. But let's let's talk about the problems with all three before we move on to Ayn Rand's ideas on this subject. But what is the problem with the idea that rights come from God? Well, if rights come from God, what do you have to prove in order to prove that you have rights? Well, the first thing you have to prove is that there's a God. Uh, which is not easy to do. There is no, there's no evidence for the existence of God, and that's why religion demands uh, that its followers have faith. The whole idea, the, the reason we have the concept of faith is because faith is the acceptance of ideas in the absence of evidence in support of those ideas. And that's what you're supposed to have in order to believe in God. So 
The idea is you can't prove it. It's, it's the old, you know, to, to those who get it, no explanation is necessary. To those who don't, no explanation is possible. Kind of thing. So you, you have to prove that there's a God, and you have to prove on top of that that somehow rights emanate from his will and attach to you or reside in you, and that's why you have them. Now, regardless of what your position on religion or God is, you have to recognize that this is a very tall order. This is a very difficult thing to do if it's possible at all. Now, I doubt I, I uh, say that it's not possible, but that my views on that are, are really beside the point here. The, the point is that proving that you have rights that come from God is near possible, if not impossible. So that's the first problem there. Now, there are other problems with that idea, too, but that's the main one. The main one is simply the lack of evidence. Now, what about the idea that rights come from government? So you, you have rights that, that you get because the government comes into existence and it creates laws, and those laws dictate what you can and can't do. Well, the problem here is that this just eviscerates the, the whole meaning of the concept of rights. Historically and logically in terms of the need of the concept, we have the concept rights precisely to identify that which you have a moral prerogative to do in advance of the existence of a government. If we, if we are talking just about what the government says you can do, we have other concepts that cover those, uh, those uh, facts of life. For instance, laws or political policies. Those concepts cover those grounds. What the concept of rights properly is supposed to identify is precisely the actions that you are uh, properly free to take uh, in advance of the existence of the government. So that the government would come to a come into existence to protect these rights. And of course, this is the way that, that the founders saw it. And if you know the uh, history of the debates, uh, in effect, uh, between uh, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, I mean, they didn't debate each other directly, but in, in, uh, Hobbes took the idea that uh, there, there are no rights. There's just what, what the government uh, says you can do. And so we've got to set up a government that's uh, uh, good. And he will dictate, or the, you know, the, the Leviathan, the leader, will dictate what everybody can and can't do, and those will be your rights. John Locke came along and said, no, no, you actually have rights prior to the existence of a government. You have natural rights, and so on. Uh, and that brings us to the idea of natural rights. So what is wrong with uh, this idea of natural rights? Well, the problem here is that to say that you have natural rights sounds very nice, and it sounds good because it's your, you're anchoring this in nature. But where historically did the advocates of natural rights say that, historically the idea of natural rights, let me back up a second. Historically the idea of natural rights is that you have natural rights because they're part and parcel of some natural moral law that is uh, uh, a part of, of being human, that's a part of human nature. And this moral law entails that you have rights to act on your, your judgment and keep and use the property that you produce and so on. But where does this moral law come from according to the natural rights theorists? So according to the founding fathers and according to John Locke and Hugo Grotius and Samuel Pufendorf, where, where does this natural law come from? And the answer is, unfortunately, that it comes from God. The natural rights theorists historically held that you have natural rights, but they're part and parcel of natural moral law, and that moral law comes from God. So really, natural rights theory, historically speaking, is just a God-given rights theory uh, with a few steps removed, but you still are getting these things from God. And so it's beset with all the same problems that God-given rights theory is beset with. Now, uh, there's some respect in which speaking of natural rights is okay, and I'll get to that later in, in the lecture. But the idea that either natural moral law just comes from God, or the idea that rights are inherent in you, like you could cut you open, you could you know cut yourself open, and, and there would be your rights, like your lung, is problematic because you you simply can't prove that you have them either way. You can't cut yourself open and find them, and if you're going to rest it historically, if you're going to rest it the way the the you know historical natural rights theorists did on natural moral law that comes from God, then you, 
can't get anywhere with that either. So Rand's theory uh, avoids these problems. It avoids these problems by identifying the actual facts that give rise to rights, the actual observable facts that give rise to rights. So I want to turn to her, her ideas. Um, and in doing so, I want to emphasize something, and that is that we have a very short period of time here. And Rand's uh, theory is extremely rich. So uh, just don't mistake what I'm giving you here for a full and complete understanding of Ayn Rand's uh, theory of rights. You'll have to do some work on your own you know, outside of this lecture to get the, the, the full deal. I've written a longer article that I can point you to at the end, which I will. But we have brief time here. So this is just a sketch. Now, in turning to Ayn Rand's ideas. Hi, um, hi Craig. Yes. Oh, Craig, sorry to jump in. We're, um, some of the students are having sound issues. Um, is there any way you can check to see if your microphone is still turned up all the way? Um, otherwise, we just advise, well, um, we advise students to put on headphones if they're having sound issues. Sure. Let me see. Uh, if I can figure out whether it's still there. One sec. Yep, no problem. Oh, it seems to have gone down. Why did it do that? Okay, I just turned it back up. That's a lot better, I think. Is that better? Let's uh, see what we get. So yeah. that's the input volume is now on full. Yep, everyone is responding back and saying it's better. <laughs> oh, good. Well, I'm sorry about that. I wish, uh, well, anyway, we'll proceed. Um, so turning to Rand's ideas now. Um, in turning to Rand's ideas, uh, I want to emphasize the fact that rights are not merely political matters. And Rand emphasized this uh, very much herself. They are also, and more fundamentally, moral matters. I want to point out that we can see this on a sort of a common sense level. We know that rights are about what people should be free to do. And this is pretty uncontroversial. The, you know, the idea that, that rights are about what you should be free to do. If we, if we put the emphasis on the word free, so rights are about what people should be free to do, we can see that rights are a political issue. If we put the emphasis on the word should, we can see that rights are a moral issue. Rights are about what people should be free to do, and that is a moral concept. <laughs> rights are moral matters. In order to know what we should be free to do, we, should know, we need to know first what we should do. And this is why, in turning to Rand's theory, we're going to have to dig down into morality proper and talk about what Ayn Rand held as the right way for people to act. How should people act? So this is the realm of morality. Now, Rand approached morality in, in a very different way than prior thinkers. She didn't turn to the existing codes of morality and say, what, you know, which one should I adopt? Instead, she turned her thinking to facts. And she said, well, morality is a code of values to guide one's choices and actions. Again, that's fairly uncontroversial. To understand what constitutes a proper code of values, uh, a logically defensible code of values, we have to understand, then, what values are and why man needs them. So this is the question that Ayn Rand began with. What are values and why does man need them? Now, looking at reality, Rand observed that a value is that which one acts to gain or keep. Now, this is a very important concept, acts, in this definition. A value is that which one acts to gain or keep. I want you to really bear that in mind for the rest of this discussion. And we can see that this is true in our own lives. You value good grades, so you act to gain and keep good grades. You value good friendships, you act to gain and keep them. You value a, a, a career that is going to fill your life with joy and hopefully make you some money. You, you value a career. People who go to church value a, a relationship that they say they get with God, so they go to church, that they, they take action. Our values are the things we act to gain or keep. Now, whether they're legitimate values is, is a secondary point at this, at this uh, stage of the argument. But we can see that that is, in fact, what values are, just in common uh, parlance. And Rand recognized that the fact that values are objects of actions can be seen not only in human uh, uh, 
you know, among human beings, but also throughout the entire animal and plant kingdom. Uh, if, you, if you look at a tree, a tree uh, turns its leaves toward the sun and seeks its roots down into the ground. It acts to gain uh, values. It, it seeks the values uh, of uh, sunlight and of nutrients in the soil. A tiger uh, chases antelope and naps in the shade. It acts to gain and keep things. And uh, if we turn to inanimate objects, we can see that they don't do this. Uh, rocks, rivers, and hammers uh, do not act to gain and keep anything. Uh, they can be, you know, you can kick a rock and it can be moved, but it doesn't act on its own. And rivers flow, but they flow because of gravitational pull of the earth and so on. And hammers, of course, don't act on their own. You can swing one, but it's not going to do its own thing. So Rand observed by looking at these facts of reality that all living things and only living things pursue values. Well, now, why do they pursue values, she asks. What are the values for? What difference does it make whether a living thing achieves its values or not? And here, Ayn Rand observed that the concept of value is not a primary. It presupposes an answer to the question of value to whom and for what. It presupposes an entity capable of achieving a goal in the face of an alternative. A tree faces the alternative of reaching sunlight and nutrients or not. The tiger faces the alternative of catching its prey or not. And you and I and all human beings face the alternative of achieving our values or not, whether they're uh, you know, food or medicine or a career or a romance. So, what happens if a living thing achieves its values, and what happens if it doesn't? If a living thing achieves its values, then it can remain in existence. It remains alive. If a living thing is unable to achieve its values, if a tiger can't catch the gazelle, if you can't achieve food, if the tree can't get sunlight, the living thing goes out of existence it ceases to exist. Its chemical elements may remain, but its life literally goes out of existence. And Ayn Rand points out that it is only living things that face this fundamental alternative, existence or non-existence. And only living things have values and need to pursue them precisely in order to stay in existence, to remain in existence. On these observations and others, again, I'm giving you just a snapshot of Rand's thinking on this, but on these observations and others, Ayn Rand arrived at the conclusion that life is the ultimate value for any living thing. It's the end value. It's the final goal toward which all of the thing's other values are the means. And she arrived at the conclusion that life is, in fact, the standard of value. It's the reason we have values, and it's the reason we need values. You can think of it this way. Only life makes values possible. If you're not, if you're not a living thing, you, you can't have values. And only life makes values necessary. If you're not a living thing that has values, you don't need to pursue anything. Rocks don't need to go after anything because they've got nothing to lose by just sitting there. Right? So those two facts, that only life makes values possible and only life makes values necessary, give rise to the principle that it is really the case that life is rooted in excuse me, that values are rooted in life, and that life is, in fact, the standard of value for any given living thing. Its own life is its standard of value. With these observations, Rand concluded that the standard of moral value, the standard of value for human beings who have free will, you know, which separates us from, from other animals, is human life, the requirements of human life. What do we need to do to live? And what conditions do we need in order to live as human beings? Now, if you add this principle, that life is the standard of value, and that's a fairly uncontroversial uh, thing uh, to that point. It's, it's obviously biologically based. You can see these facts in reality, and you arrive at this principle that a living thing's life is its standard of value. Fairly uncontroversial. If, however, we jump uh, or mix that in with the observable fact that human beings are individuals, each with his own body, his own mind, his own life, 
we arrive at the principle of egoism. And this is where Rand's ideas get controversial. It's an observable fact that we are separate beings and that we do have our own minds, our own bodies, our own lives. And if human life is the standard of value, and the reason that that's the case is because individual human beings have to act in a certain way in order to live, it is for each human being his own life that is his ultimate value and his own life that he should pursue and protect. And that's really what the principle of egoism says. It just says that each person should pursue his own values and is the proper beneficiary of the values that he achieves for himself. Now, there's a lot I could say about egoism, and of course, Ayn Rand has a whole theory of egoism, and it's, she's got a whole morality tied in with a bunch of uh, virtues and uh, other values and, and things that go toward uh, making an individual's life possible. But we're beelining to see how all of this supports the principle of individual rights. So I'm, I'm only going to say a few words about uh, the meat and potatoes of egoism, if you will. The question, if it's true that we should act to uh, gain and keep the values on which our life depends, the question is then, how? What is our means of doing that? How do we achieve uh, our values? And Rand's answer to this is, uh, in a nutshell, that man's basic means of survival is his faculty of reason, his ability to think, to observe reality, to identify causal relationships, and to uh, uh, figure out what things he needs in order to produce uh, values and live. And his means of doing that is, is simply reason. Man, in a nutshell, in, in just, just a word, must act rationally if he is to live. Animals act instinctively. Plants act on vegetative, you know, automatic vegetative uh, processes, uh, photosynthesis and the like. But we don't act automatically, nor do we know automatically what is good for our life and what is not, which is why so many people ruin their lives, because they never learn what's good for their life. So the fact is we're not born with this knowledge, but to gain it, we have to use reason. And we can. We can look at reality and form principles about what uh, constitutes life-serving action and what constitutes uh, life-thwarting action. And we can develop uh, a whole series of principles about how to live. And again, Ayn Rand did this in her theory of egoism. But for our purposes here, suffice it to say that you have to act on your judgment. You have to think rationally and act accordingly in order to live. And you can see this in just your own life today. If you don't think rationally and act accordingly with respect to your schoolwork, you'll fail out of college and you won't, get, uh, you won't, you won't graduate and get the fruit that comes with that. If you uh, don't think rationally about a career or friendships or anything else in your life, you wind up in, in trouble or, or in, in, in a bad situation. You, you, I'm sure you all have friends who approach romantic relationships irrationally and what happens, right? It's catastrophic. It turns into a mess. So we have to go by reason if we want to live and achieve our values. Man's rational judgment is his basic means of survival. Now this brings us to a crucial question. If it's true that we have to act on our judgment in order to live, we have to act on our own judgment, then the question, what can stop us from acting on our judgment, is a very important question. Because if something can actually stop us from acting on our basic means of living, then that thing is very dangerous. And we need to uh, take precautions against it. So what can stop us <coughs> from acting on our judgment? Well, Ayn Rand's answer is that the only thing that can stop a person from acting on his judgment is other people. And the only way they can do it is by means of physical force. Now, the easiest way to see this <clears throat> is to imagine yourself uh, marooned on, a, on an island all alone. So there you are, you're on the island. You, you, let's say you wake up in the morning and you say, well, what do, what do I want to do today? Well, I'm hungry, I need some food, so I'll go fishing, you know, fashion a, a fishing rod out of this stick and some, uh, some uh, vines, or I'll go find some berries or whatever. Or maybe you think you need to build a better shelter or, or, or your first shelter, and so you decide you're going to do that. In any event, whatever your judgment is, whatever you think you should do, you're free to do because there's nothing to stop you. But suppose a brute rose up on the island, gets out of his boat, 
and straps you to a tree with some vines. Now, can you act on your judgment? Well, clearly not. You're tied to a tree. You can't do anything, right? His force has gotten between your thinking and your doing. You can no longer act on your judgment. If you thought you were going to go fishing today and that you should go fishing, you're not doing it anymore. If you were going to pick berries or build a shelter, you're not doing it. He has, by using force, stopped you from acting on your judgment. Now, that's total force. So let's acknowledge that there are degrees of force. Uh, first of all, he could keep you alive strapped to the tree. You're not necessarily going to die immediately, right, because he could stuff berries down your throat and keep you alive for months. But would you be living a human life if he were to do that? If he were to keep you alive strapped to the tree, would that be a human life? Well, obviously not. Why? Because a human life is a life guided by the judgment of one's mind. We just talked about the fact that, that reason, your own judgment and your act, use, use of reason, is what is your fundamental means of living. And this, this gives rise to the fact that, that a human life is a life guided by the judgment of one's mind. If you can't act on your judgment, you cannot live fully as a human being. Now, when you're tied to a tree, you can't act as a human being at all. You're just, you're just a piece of tree getting very stuff in it. Right? But let's say he unties you from the tree. And he says, well, you're welcome to roam the island, and you can even build things. But whatever you build belongs to me. Whatever you produce is mine. Well, are you free now? Now, this guy's a brute, and he's big, and you can't out, out uh, you know, wrestle him. So that's part of the, the uh, experiment here. Well, obviously, you're not free. This guy, if he can overpower you, uh, you are basically just his plaything or his, his slave. Well, suppose he says, you can keep a third of what you produce, and I'll keep two-thirds. Are you free now? Well, no. You're less uh, enslaved than you were before, but you are still a serf. right? So there are degrees of, of force. But whatever degree of force is used against a human being, it stops him from acting on his judgment, his basic means of living. And therefore, it stops him from living fully as a human being. Now, this principle that force stops people from living as human beings is as true back in society as it is out there on that island. Suppose a girl is going to the store to buy groceries with money in her pocket, and a, a thug jumps out from behind a dumpster and points a gun at her head and says, give me your money or die. Well, now she can no longer act on her judgment. She, her judgment told her that she should go to the store and buy groceries with her $20 bill or whatever. And now the guy is going to take that money, because she has no alternative. She's got to give him the money, or she's going to get shot in the head. So he takes the money and runs off. Can she act on her judgment? No. Now, granted, he's gone, but can she spend the $20 on food? No. That $20 is gone. He has it. The thief has it. She can't spend that $20. She can't do what her judgment said she should do, namely spend that money on food. She can go get another $20, she can go get other money, but that money is gone. So even though the force initiator is gone, his force lingers by means of the fact that he has taken her property. Now, we can multiply examples like this. Uh, do another quick one. Take the issue of fraud. Suppose you go to buy a, a used car, and everything looks great. It's got 60,000 miles. The guy wants $10,000 for it kick the tires, take it for a spin, everything's fine, you buy the car. Well, as you drive off, he snickers because he knows that he set back the odometer. It's actually got 120,000 miles on it. Well, are you driving the car you bargained for? Well, clearly not. You were willing to buy a car that had 60,000 miles on it. You are now driving a different car. So by means of false pretense, he got your money, your $10,000, and you didn't get what you were willing to pay for that uh, with that $10,000. So his force, again, has gotten between your judgment, your thinking, and your acting. Uh, and we can see this not only there, but in, in more substantial sort of economic issues. Uh, an employer seeking to hire somebody for $6 an hour, because that's all the, that he can afford, and that's all that this particular job is worth to him, given the profits uh, of his business. Uh, and the government steps in and says, well, you can't hire somebody for $6 an hour. Minimum wage is 8 or $9 an hour. Well, this is the government getting between his thinking and his doing, his judgment and his ability to act. A bank seeking to purchase an insurance company 
uh, because it wants to expand its its holdings and integrate uh, its its uh, business on on different levels. And then the antitrust department steps in and says, "No, no, no, no! You can't do that. We have laws against that, et cetera, et cetera." In each case, the force used against the person stops him from acting on his judgment, his basic means of living. So if we want to live in a social system uh, among other people, if we want to live among other people, and of course we get enormous value by living among other people, uh, specialization and d division of labor and all of that makes it so that somebody like me, but no idea how to make an automobile or an iPhone, can have these things nevertheless and, and, uh, and can live uh, you know, fruitfully because of it, even though I chose something else. And of course you can go into whatever specialty you like, and we can all profit and, and gain from each other. And of course, this is not even to mention friendships and romantic relationships and recreation and the things that we do together. So living together is extremely uh, uh, profitable for us. And to live together in a society is good, providing that we have some principles that stop people from using force against us, some principles that enable us to live fully as human beings. And the principle, the fundamental principle that identifies the fact that you must be left free is the principle of individual rights. The principle of individual rights is the moral truth that in order for you to live fully as a human being, you must be left free. Physical force must be banned from social relationships. Why? Not because God said so not because the government said so, and not because there's something inherent or inside of you that you can cut open and find that says that, there's, that this is the case, but rather because we can observe the facts of reality that give rise to the need of this principle based on the requirements of human life. In order to live together, we have to be free to act on our judgment. If other people can force you to act against your judgment, or if the government can force you to act against your judgment, you simply cannot live by your own judgment. You cannot live fully as a human being. So this is where, in Ayn Rand's view, the principle of individual rights comes from. It comes from observing reality, observing the nature of value, observing what a moral, co a moral code is and why man needs it, Observing the basic requirements of human life, fundamentally the, the requirement of thinking rationally and acting accordingly, or going by your own judgment, and then identifying well, what can stop you from doing that, namely force, and then identifying a principle or, or uh, forming a principle that says, in effect, well, if force can stop people from living as human beings, then there, you know, quote, in effect, there ought to be a law. Well, there is a law. It's called the principle of individual rights. It is a moral law that, that uh, prohibits other people, including governments, and especially governments, from using force against innocent human beings, those who have not used force. Now, there is, of course, uh, a, a, uh, you know, the, the use of retaliatory force if somebody attacks you uh, is a perfectly legitimate thing. Um, you, because you have a right to live, you, as a corollary, have a right to defend your life uh, against those who try to uh, thwart it or harm it. So that right is a corollary of your right to, to life. And I could argue further, if we had time to talk about government, that there is a case to be made that that right uh, can be delegated to a government and properly is delegated to a government so that your rights are protected by a government and by objective law rather than just the, the whim of the street, which can turn quickly into Hatfields and McCoys. Um, but that would go uh, to some extent beyond our topic today, and we only have a few minutes before I want to turn to questions. So what I want to do for the last few minutes is emphasize something about uh, Rand's theory of rights here. I gave you a very quick uh, you know, run through of, of how Ayn Rand's theory is derived from observation. And midway through this, we realized that rights, uh, or that the, the principle of egoism, the idea that you should act on your own judgment, or you should act in your own best interest, and you should keep the, the fruits of your labor, that is really the centerpiece of Ayn Rand's ethics. 
the thing I want to emphasize here is that the principle of individual rights and the principle of egoism are essentially the same principle. Whereas the principle of egoism says that you should act in your own best interest and that you're the proper beneficiary of the uh, goods that you produce, the values you produce. The principle of individual rights says, yes, and since that's true, you must be free, you must be left free to act on your judgment so that you can live egoistically, so that you can live fully as a human being. And the reason I emphasize this is because if we want to defend liberty, and I know all of you do, but if you want to defend liberty, you have to do it on moral grounds. And the only possible moral grounds to defend liberty are the grounds of egoism. The, the moral principle that each person, in fact, should act on his own judgment and should leave others free to do the same gives rise to the principle that that is then a moral, you know, that that's a moral fact that we have to have uh, uh, freedom from force. And you can't separate these. You cannot try, as conservatives have tried for eons, to defend freedom while ignoring uh, or denying the egoistic base. And nor can you do what I think many libertarians attempt to do, which is try to say, well, egoism and all that Randian stuff is just too controversial. We don't want to go there. We want to hold hands and get under a big political tent and say, hey, you know, we're all for liberty, so it doesn't matter you know, where you think it comes from or what you think rights are or what you think the basis is. I take issue with that, and I think you should really seriously think about this yourself, because if it's true, as Rand emphasized, that the only reason you have a right to act on your own judgment is because you should act on your own judgment and that you should act in your best interest, then to legalize liberty, in effect, or to legalize capitalism, if you will, is to legalize self-interest. And if you, if you eschew self-interest, if you condemn it, if you regard it as immoral, then you simply cannot advocate a social system whose essence is the legalization of self-interest. Uh, so, in sum, if you really want to defend liberty, I urge you, don't take my word for it, this has been a very brief seminar, I urge you to look into Ayn Rand's ideas on this. Read her book, The Virtue of Selfishness and Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. Uh, the three essays in particular that I would recommend are uh, Man's Rights, Collectivized Rights, and uh, The Nature of Government. Uh, read my essay, uh, on which this short talk is loosely based. The, the essay goes into much more detail, and that's titled Ayn Rand's Theory of Rights, The Moral Foundation of a Free Society. Um, and uh, take a look at some of the art, other articles in the Objective Standard. And think about this. Uh, you know, if, if something doesn't make sense to you, you should not accept it. That's one of the uh, fundamental principles of Ayn Rand's thinking and her philosophy. So nobody is saying, you know, take this and, and run with it. Uh, I'm simply saying that I think if you turn and look at these ideas, that you are going to find them very compelling. And that if you do embrace them, I think you'll find that you are much better able to defend liberty, which, for goodness sakes, we need to defend. Thank you. That's been uh, 45 minutes, so we'll go ahead and take questions now. Okay, thank you so much, Craig. Um, and to all of our participants, be sure to type in any questions into the question box that's on your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, we do have a first question already. Uh, the first question is, um, is the only way to achieve full, is the only way to achieve full liberty um, a stateless society? Was Rand's advocacy of limited government a call for limited rights violation? And also a similar question um, asking if you could explain how individual rights are incompatible with a stateless society. Okay. Uh, no, Rand did, Rand did not advocate a stateless society. She regarded anarchism as uh, antithetical to freedom because if there is no uh, government to defend, objectively define uh, uh, laws that protect individual rights and to defend uh, those rights um, by use of retaliatory force, 
then what you have is uh, chaos. You just have Hatfields and McCoys, my, my gang versus your gang, and ultimately what you're going to have is some kind of a dictatorship. The, the guy with the, the gang with the, the uh, biggest weapons or the, the best ability to use them is going to wind up lording it over the others, and that's the way uh, it will end up. So Rand was staunchly against anarchism uh, or anarchy, and uh, she uh, she advocated essentially what the founding fathers uh, of America uh, set up, which is a constitutional republic, not a democracy. Democracy means uh, rule by majority, and that is uh, the founders were explicitly against that. And unfortunately, uh, almost everybody on the right today talks about how wonderful it would be if we could have a democracy, and we're trying to spread spread democracy in the Middle East and so on and so forth. No, the founders and Rand advocated a rights respecting Republic. That's the best way to put it. A republic in which there's a constitution, so a fundamental law that dictates what the government is free to do and not free to do. And a proper constitution says that the government may do one thing and only one thing, and that is protect individual rights by banning physical force from social relationships and by using retaliatory force only against those who initiate force. Um, and so that's what she, she advocated. Now, what does a proper government consist of? Well, briefly, uh, you, you've got to have the courts to uh, establish and uh, determine, uh, or not to establish, but to uh, weigh uh, cases, whether you know, if there are disputes, whether they're, they're between uh, two honest men or whether, whether it's a criminal who broke into your liquor store. Uh, there's got to be some place to go to determine whether or not somebody's broken the law. You've got to have a legislature to draw up the laws uh, and to determine whether or not laws are actually rights-respecting laws or rights-violating laws. Um, you've got to have a military to protect us from foreign invaders. You've got to have police to protect us from uh, domestic criminals and so forth. So, uh, But what you don't have is you, you don't have uh, the Department of energy, you don't have the Department of Education, you don't have the FDA, and so on and so forth. You have only the elements of government that are necessary to the protection of rights. And um, so, uh, now there were three parts to that question. One part was, did Rand advocate a stateless society? Oh, I know one of the parts was, so did Rand advocate uh, semi-rights violations because she advocates a state? No. A proper state, a proper government, does not violate rights. Um, by delegating our legitimate uh, uh, right to retaliatory force to the government, uh, we are not violating anyone's rights. Uh, if you don't like the government, don't give the government any money, don't support the government. Uh, nobody's going to stop you from doing that in a free society. I mean, uh, in today's world, when you're taxed and regulated and, and whatnot, you can't avoid that. But under a proper government, you don't have. If you don't want, if you don't like the government, don't support it. But you can't stop me from delegating uh, my uh, uh, right of self-defense to a government uh, and others from doing so too. Uh, nor can you. And I know this question will come around. Uh, nor can you say, "Well, I want to have competing governments." No, uh, a government. It's, there's a first come, first serve situation here. Whatever government gets set up first, as long as it's a rights-respecting government. Uh, that governs within a specific geographic area and, uh, and uh, establishes proper laws and proper means of protecting them, and that is a legitimate government. And um, there, is, there is no right to overthrow a legitimate government. So I think I answered the questions. Was there a third part I did not get to, Leah? I Hello? think you're good, and we have a, a couple follow-up questions um, okay. to that as well. Um, so why does anarchy on the level of governments work, but not of private institutions that bear their own costs when they engage in aggressive behavior? And uh, would Rand's rights imply, or would Rand's theory imply a world government of any sort? Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Rain theory does not imply a world government because uh, a, a government can only function properly within a, a, a geographic sphere that is possible to, to govern. Moreover, um, 
to have only one government would be quite risky. I don't think uh, any, anybody wants to live, live on a planet where you, you can't go anywhere if you think the government you're under is no good. Um, uh, as to uh, the, the, the question of whether um, private organizations who use force uh, or aggression, I think was the word, uh, as, as to what the difference between them and government is, well, first of all, if a, if a private organization is, is using aggression against somebody, that, that is properly illegal and the government should come in and, and uh, arrest who's ever initiating the force and, and put them before a court. Um, there's, no, there's no right to initiate force against people. Um, so uh, 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 if, a, if a business is doing that, if a business puts a gun to your head and says you have to buy my software, uh, then uh, that is properly illegal and they should be uh, arrested and tried. Um, the government does not, a proper government now, does not force you to do anything. Uh, the, the, the only thing a proper government does is it prohibits you from forcing other people to do things. So if you initiate force against someone else, if you're a, a, comp a software company and you try to force people to buy your goods or if you commit fraud or uh, breach of contract or any number of other things, uh, extortion or the like, then the government can step in and say, hey, you, you, that, that's, uh, that's force, you can't do that, uh, and so we're going to have to remedy that, uh, whether you go to court or somebody gets arrested or somebody gets thrown in jail or in the case that somebody's actually harmed substantially or killed, then, you know, I mean, there's, uh, there, there are all sorts of degrees of punishment that are proper. But the government cannot a proper government cannot initiate force in any way, shape, or form. So there's a completely different, these are two completely different animals. A private business is in the economy. It does its business by means of production and trade, and its power is not the power of the gun, but the power of money. It's the power of the dollar. The government uh, is not in the economy. It's properly completely separate from the economy. It cannot it doesn't produce things to sell in the economy, and it doesn't dictate who can do what in the economy. All it does is it stands back with its potential force and says, if anyone uses force, we will step in uh, to stop that. So th there's no equating, there's no properly equating uh, government with, for instance, what uh, you know, uh, Apple does. They're, they're different animals entirely. Uh, any others? Yep. Um, another question is, what is the idea of animal rights, and how is that related to human or individual rights? Uh, animal rights. All right. Um, the, the, the very reason that human beings have rights is because we are conceptual beings. We have choice. We think in order to live. It's, our, it's, it's the use of the human mind and the ability to act on our judgment that gives rise to the need of rights. If we are precluded from acting on our judgment, if somebody stops us, they get in the way either you know, with direct force or indirect force, then we can't live as human beings. And uh, according to more fundamental aspects of philosophy, namely morality, uh, you know, the, 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 the whole of morality, the whole point of human life, the purpose of human life, is for each and every one of us to live and think and produce and thrive. Uh, so if somebody is going to stop us from doing that, we need a principle to stop them from getting in our way, and that's what rights are. Now, animals don't have rights simply because they don't even uh, fit the, the requirement of rights. They don't... They don't uh, exist in the same world that human beings do, in the same you know, world of reason and choice and morality and all of the things that underlie and give rise to the need of rights. Dogs, tigers, elephants and the like, not only do they not have rights because they, they, they don't have reason and they don't have morality and they don't have the preconditions of it, but they couldn't respect rights anyway, precisely for those very reasons. If you face a hungry tiger and try to explain to him, well, look, you and I both have rights, and so I have a right to life and you have a right to life, so please don't eat me. I mean, you see where this is going. 
you, the animals not only don't have rights because they're no, they have none of the preconditions of rights, but they can't have rights because they can't respect rights. And incidentally, this is why a criminal, uh, to the extent that he violates rights, loses his rights uh, because he is making himself, by his own choice, operate on the animal level. And so he properly loses his rights. This doesn't mean that his rights aren't inalienable. Inalienable means that nobody can take your rights from you. But you can relinquish your rights uh, by, in effect, becoming an animal, by, by stooping to the level, the subhuman level, of using force against people, of initiating force against people. And that's precisely why you lose your rights. So for the same reason that a criminal who stoops to the level of an animal loses his rights, animals simply don't have them. Now, I should add, I mean, this does not mean that it is moral to do whatever you want to an animal. If somebody beats a dog, you know, senselessly or tortures animals or whatever, that is extremely immoral, um, but it is not a violation of rights. Uh, something can be immoral and not be a violation of rights, so don't mistake this to mean that uh, abusing animals is, is not immoral. It most certainly is. Thank you so much, Craig. Our next question. Um, there have been a number of RAND revisionists in academic philosophy. Without going into too much detail, do you believe that RAND's egoist-based justification for rights requires such revision and modification to be fully defensible? Uh, no. I, I think RAND's uh, justification and argument for uh, rights is, is perfectly sound uh, as she gave it. Um, I don't think any any revision needs to be done. Now, that's not to say that there aren't, uh, you know, that different people can't have different ways of presenting her ideas, and fruitfully so. I mean, I and other objectivist intellectuals travel all over the country and the world doing just that all the time. We don't just stand up in front of people and read The Virtue of Selfishness at them or read Atlas Shrugged to them, right? So it's, it's one thing to say, it's one thing to, to understand Rand's ideas and to say here, uh, is what she uh, essentially said, and to give your own examples to support it, or you know, or whatever. It's another thing, and perfectly legitimate thing, if somebody thinks that Rand erred somewhere, to say that you think she erred, and then to point out where you think she erred. Uh, and if you you can do that and find some error she made, then I mean, uh, you you should. Uh, I do not know of of any uh, flaws in her argument for rights, and I don't think anyone has pointed any out. I think her her theory of rights is perfectly sound. Um, so if, if uh, academics uh, are claiming that there are flaws in them, um, uh, I, I would like to see them. The few that I've read, and I won't name names here either, but the few that I've read are, are laughably uh, uh, off the mark, and they, they commit uh, fallacies that Rand herself identified, uh, stolen concepts, package deals, and the like, uh, in the very process of trying to claim that Rand does not um, doesn't succeed in her defense of rights. So um, there's nothing wrong with, with challenging Rand. Uh, but I think you should do so honestly. And, and if you're going to challenge Rand, you, you really ought to know what she said and what her argument is, not just you know, shoot from the hip, which unfortunately a lot of people do. OK, our next question. Um, is there a way to determine which rights should be governed and protected at the state level and which at the federal level, according to Ayn Rand's theories of rights? You know, Rand never specified, to my knowledge, she never, she never discussed, you know, which rights should be uh, uh, protected at the, the federal level and which at the state and which at the municipal and so on. Um, and certainly this much is, is true, and I know she held this, that there's no, you can't say, well, uh, the, the federal government can't, uh, can't outlaw um, uh, the use of uh, uh, certain drugs, but the states can. Well, no. If, if the use of drugs is a right, if you have a right to act on your own judgment, as long as you're not harming others, it, it's improper to say, well, the federal government can't violate that right, but the state governments can. So one thing that I think has to be borne in mind when, when one wants to think about what can this, the, the federal government and the state governments uh, properly do 
is that neither government can legitimately violate rights. So I think what, what it comes down to at the state level is it's going to be things that are optional, um, whether or not you can turn right on red on public roads. I mean, ultimately, there shouldn't be public roads. But insofar as there are, decisions like that have to be made. Um, uh, the, consensual, the age of consensual sex, um, you know, that is not written in stone uh, somewhere what that should be. I think it should be somewhere between, you know, 16 and, uh, and 18 or maybe 15 and 19. I don't know. I mean, it's debatable, right? So I think that kind of question is properly left to the states because it's not, uh, it's not a matter of, well, if it's 17, it's violating rights, but if it's 16, it's not. Uh, there is some, some legitimate uh, flexibility and room for, um, for uh, differences there. Um, so I think those kinds of things clearly can be left to the states. Um, and I, I don't have a lot more to say on that. Um, there, there are certain laws that are more easily um, enforced at a local level than at a national level. Obviously, you know, traffic laws, certain traffic laws. So um, I think those are properly left to the states in many cases. But, but Rand did not specify much on this. So if the question was, what, what did Rand say about that? To my knowledge, she said very little or nothing. Okay, and we have a ton of questions coming in, but unfortunately we only have time for one more question. Um, when does an individual's rights appear? Is it a result of human birth, or do these rights emerge with rational development? Oh, good. I'm glad this question is the final one. Um, wh when do rights appear? Well, rights are moral principles defining and sanctioning a man's freedom of action in a social context. And this social context, that last phrase there, is very important. Uh, we have rights only when we are among other people. You know, if you're alone on an island, there's no such thing as rights. There's no rights to, to freedom of action. You, you have freedom of action no matter what. There's nobody there to stop you. So rights only come into existence in a social context. They, they come into existence precisely because human beings need to be able to act on their judgment in order to live as human beings. So only human beings who can act on their judgment, and to the degree that they can act on their judgment, have rights. Now, that said, of course, because somebody's mind is going to go immediately to, well, what about an infant? Well, let me back beyond, go into the, the womb for a second. Because of, the, because of what, what rights are and where they come from, uh, fetuses do not have rights. Uh, they simply don't have them. So they're not in a social context. They are a biological, I, I don't use this term derogatorily, but in, in, in the medical term, they are biologically a parasite at that point. They are living off the mother and inside of the mother, and they, uh, are, they simply don't have rights. Now, this does not mean that terminating a pregnancy willy-nilly and irrationally is moral. It's not. It, uh, terminating a pregnancy is very dangerous to, your, to the woman's life, and if she's not thoughtful about whether to get pregnant and whether she needs an abortion and the like, then she's being ir irrational and thus immoral. But uh, it is not violating the fetus's rights to uh, abort a fetus because a fetus doesn't have rights. Now, a, uh, uh, an infant, uh, the moment uh, a fetus is born and is thus individuated uh, and becomes a separate entity, uh, then it has rights. But its rights are limited by its capacity. It is a separate individual being. Reason is its means of survival, but its rational faculty is not yet developed. So its rights are in effect, I don't know if this is the best way to say it, but it's the best way I know offhand. They're held, his rights are in effect held in trust by his parents, who are morally responsible for him, until he is able to uh, uh, form his own judgments and, and live by the, by the use of his own mind. And so, the issue of children's rights is complicated, uh, at, least, at least in terms of what philosophers of law have to work out about that. But it's relatively simple in the sense that children have rights because they are individuated human beings and because their mind is ultimately their means of survival. But because their mind is not yet developed, they're not able to exercise their rights fully 
uh, because if you said to a two-year-old, well, you go do what you want, he would, you know, shortly crawl his way out into the street and get killed, right? So obviously, uh, of necessity, somebody has to look out for him until he is capable of, of making his own decisions. And um, so children do have rights. They come into existence when the child is born, and they, uh, the, the child is, over time, able to uh, uh, enjoy his rights and embrace his rights fully on his own uh, more and more as he develops. That's the easiest brief answer. Okay, well, thank you so much, Craig, and to all of our participants this evening. Um, we apologize if we didn't get to your questions, but please feel free to continue the discussion with other participants in the chat room or on the Facebook event. And I hope you can all continue coming back to our webinars to learn more throughout the year. For students who are interested in learning more about Ayn Rand's philosophy, uh, campus groups can request copies of Atlas Shrug. Um, you can check out the program on SFL's website under the Resources tab for more information. Our next webinar is next Wednesday, January 25th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time with Chris Preble of Cato on a libertarian foreign policy in the 21st century. To register for the webinar, please visit studentsforliberty.org. On a final note, shortly you will receive a follow-up email where you will find more detailed information about SFL on our next webinar. You'll also receive a survey to evaluate the webinar. Please take a couple of minutes to fill it out. It helps us to know how to improve our programs and makes these webinars more interesting for you. And with that, I think we are officially wrapped up. Thank you, Craig, and thank you, everyone, for your time this evening. Have a wonderful night. Thank you, Leah.